welcome participants to lecture number 2 in week 4 today the topic i have chosen is to introduce you loop tuck and float these are the three basic structural element in most of the weft knitted constructions so today's lecture is actually very very important because if you understand these loop tuck and float stitches you would be able to express all weft knitted structure that is available to you so let's look at these stitches before we move in the last class i have introduced you four structural platform on which you can create these type of stitches loop tuck and float so those four platform which is popular in weft knitting category is plain where you have either technical front or technical back loops on the surface the second structure is rib which belongs to double jersey structure where in a course you can find technical front and back loops alternatively the other two double jersey structure was pearl and interlock so in pearl alternating courses are technical front and back in interlock actually it is made from intermeshing of two ribs so basically there is two feeder system one feeder system make one rib structure and the other feeder system actually creates other rib structure and these two rib structure are combined in the same course which is shown here all the technologies for making these fabric structures are different plain fabric we usually make it on single bed machine these three structures rib pearl and interlock we usually create on double bed machines in double bed machines rib is widely popular in v bed machines where you can create rib structure in rib knitting machine in circular category also you can create rib structure pearl you have to have different mechanism where needle has to transfer so either you have pearl knitting machines where needle is transferred from one bed to other or you can have the loop transfer mechanism in the v bed machine itself so that is also possible in interlock machines you have two sets of uh, long butt needles and short butt needles on the two different beds usually it is found in interlock circular double bed machines the beauty of these four structural platform is they have different characteristics so if you see plane this is highly unstable it curl uh, it can be unravel for both the ends if you see rib you can only open it from the ends the first course will not allow you to take out the yarn also if you see rib pearl and interlock they are quite stable structure they do not curl so that's why uh, sometimes most of these structures are preferred on the edges of the garments so this is what we have learned um, there are a lot of uh, structural differences and the properties are also different so depending on what type of uh, property you want to achieve from a garment you choose one of these structural platform at different sections okay now let's move to the next part which is to create stitches on each of these platforms so when you see any of these platforms we can change the nature of stitches so in this particular lecture you are going to learn about the basic fundamental of stitches where we control the intermeshing points so for example if you see this particular stitches it has four intermeshing points if you see this particular stitch it has no intermeshing points if you see this one it has only two intermeshing points so these three stitches are basically loop tuck and float which we are going to explain you in detail and how we are making these type of stitches on the machine what sort of cam track we have to change for the needle so that the needles can create these type of stitches so the whole lecture is devoted to let you know about loop tuck and float these three elements of a structure are extremely important from weft knitting point of view because this is the basis so once you know the potential of each of these structural elements you can design n number of fabrics with different properties so from engineering point of view from research point of view you need to understand this loop stitches their properties their influence on the structure from design point of view also it make a huge difference if you play with these type of elements 
you can come up with very very beautiful designs so for the design students as well as engineering students this lecture is very very important so i expect you to be pay attention especially in this particular lecture so let's uh, move to the first stitch we call it loop so we have seen this word uh, so many times in last 3 to 4 weeks but fundamentally loop and stitch are two different terms uh, in reality we sometimes exchange these words and we frequently use in knitting but in reality in scientific way these two terms are completely different so a loop stitch in the first lecture itself i introduced you some of the basic fundamentals about intermeshing points so if you see any basic knit structures each loop is intermeshing with top and bottom loops so if you see the top loop the red one it is intermeshing with the black one at two locations okay but if you see the bottom loop here the bottom loop is intermeshing with at two points with the top loops so naturally not all the loops has similar nature of intermeshing points so in some sense these loops are different if you see the middle loop at the center you can have four intermeshing points 1 2 3 and 4 so this is actually the full loop we call this as a full loop because this loop is actually perfectly stable because it is being hold across all the legs and head parts so this we call it loop stitch so now you can understand how a particular loop stitch is different from a normal loop a loop can be very confusing words it can be having two uh intermeshing points it can have uh, four intermeshing points but a loop stitch means it we must have four intermeshing points so the main element of most of the plain jersey structure is the loop stitch if you exclude the top loops and bottom loops so if you exclude the bottom loops and top loops most of the loops are a perfect loop stitch if you see this particular loop stitch it actually being created by three needle loops so to create loop number 2 you need to create the bottom loops which is the loop number 1 and also to provide intermeshing points at the head you need to create the new loop which is loop number 3 so that the loop 2 can acquire four intermeshing points so naturally to create a loop stitch we need to create three needle loops in a course so basically you have to run the machine at least three cores to create one perfect loop stitch along the way you have to first create loop number 1 then loop number 2 and then loop number 3 so loop number 2 will actually will become then loop stitch because then only you can get four intermeshing points so needle to create loop number 2 at least run for three courses on the machines then only you would be able to create a loop stitch so to create a loop stitch the normal sequence of loop formation must be followed so the needles must clear the old loop then catch the new yarn then pull the yarn and then knock over the old loop and then loop is should be formed so all these three loops should be created in a perfect sequence of loop formation so if you miss any one of the processing either if you miss clearing then you cannot be able to get four intermeshing points so to get four intermeshing points in the three courses the needle should perform exactly the same nature of movement so this is how the needle should move so needle should hit the rise cam then it should hit the clearing cam then at this moment the old loop should be cleared and then while descending it has it is catching the yarn it is pulling the yarn then it is hitting the stitch loop and in this way it is creating the loop stitch if you see the notation because uh, in the subsequent lecture more and more complicated structure of knitting will come so naturally to describe those structure we cannot all the time will be designing the fabric with loops rather we will give some kind of notation to the fabric because this will help you in understanding the complicated structure we have seen the technical back and technical front loops 
we represent this technical back by zero in a box, but there are some other notations which you can find in the literature. So I'm going to introduce you to other two types of notations, especially the point notation and bar notation. So box notation I've already introduced you in week number one, but in most of the research articles or in, in normal practice, you will find most of the designers, they use point notation or bar notations in describing the fabric structure. So if you see technical back loops, it is being created obviously a needle is the hard core of knitting. So to make or represent a particular loop, we must introduce needle as well. For example, the needle ha can be represented by dot. So this dot actually indicates the needles. And to create this particular loop, you can see the yarn has been pulled from the top of the screen towards the bottom. So it, you can say from the front side, it is going towards the back side. So we can say uh, the needle has two sides, the front side and the back side. And if you see the movement of yarn, actually the yarn first moves from back to front side. It means the needle actually moves from back side of the loop towards the front side of the fabric. On the front side of the fabric, it is actually catching the yarn and bringing that loop towards the back side. Okay? From back side, it is coming out of the plane where it is catching the yarn and then it is going inside. So this is how, so from back side, it is going to front side and then from front side, it is coming to back side. So this is how you actually denote the loop of technical back. So this notation not only gives you the symbol of technical back, but also it will help you to understand how the yarn is actually moving. So if you follow the yarn path, the yarn is moving from back side to front side and then from front to back side. So this is actually the point notation. Uh, sometimes we also denote by bar notation. So bar is also helpful in representing the needles. So if you remember the lecture of needle gating, where we were representing all the needles of a bed by bars arranged in a parallel sequence. So sometimes instead of dot, we represent needle by a bar. The nature will again remain same. It is going from back side towards front side and then from front side to back side. So these are the three notation for technical back loops. Uh, zero for box representation. For bar, we represent like this. For point, we represent like this. This type of notation is extremely useful when we are explaining the fabric structures. I expect you all to learn these type of notations uh, because it will help you in fabric understanding. So now let's see the front part. So in technical front loop, you can see the red loop is coming towards the front side. Front side, it means out of the plane. So you can expect there is something going inside the plane. From that side, it is catching the yarn and it is pulling that yarn from the back of the plane towards the front side of the plane. This is how the technical front loops is created. So again, you have the front side and back side. Here, the movement starts from the front side, then going back side, and then from back side to front side. So here, the movement starts from here, from front side, it is going towards back side, and then from back side, it is going towards front side. So this is how the representation is opposite compared to the technical back side. So if you take the mirror image along vertical plane, you will get this type of representation. In bar notation again, the same nature, instead of dot, you represent bar for the needle. So this is how the technical front loops is represented in point form and in bar form. And uh, this is the box representation. So point and bar form is wide popular because it's not only giving you the indication of technical back and front, but also it is, it is giving you the nature of needles, how they are placed on the machines. Also it is giving the movement of yarn from front to back side of the needle. So this is how these two types of notations is quite popular um, in weft knitting. So now let's move to the next stitch, which is the tuck loop. So this is the next important structural element you will find most of the weft knitted structures, where you will see that the loop has actually only two intermeshing points. 
here you can see especially this red loop the legs are actually become open and this is open because the foot is not intermeshing with the below loops so here the most fundamental difference you can observe here is uh, from the first column and second column where three loops are created in a sequence in three courses but in the second column you can see the old loop which is the blue one which was supposed to be knocked out but it is still hold it by the second loop so the head in this particular column in the second course the head of the needle is having two loops being hold at this location and the foot of this red loop is missing because it is not being created because this old loop is not fixing the foot part this is why legs of the loop become open so this is the fundamental difference in the structural uh, part of tuck and loop stitch so you can see here the legs become open so there is basically the sinker part is somehow missing for this particular loop okay so the sinker part become miss so this is the sinker part uh, but unfortunately for this loop the sinker part is not available and you can see the legs are actually spread so let's see how we actually create this type of uh, stitch on the machine so for example let's suppose if you want to create a tuck stitch on needle number 2 so this dots indicates the needle this is how the needles are carrying the needle loop at a particular moment on the machine so to create tuck stitch you have to follow certain sequence so in next course needles n1 and n3 are clearing the old loop which is the blue one and then it is catching the new loop this should be the sequence it should be following so needle number 1 and 3 needle 1 and 3 it has actually cleared the old loop and it has catched the new yarn which is the red loop and it has knocked the old loop on the new loop which is the red yarn so both n1 and n3 are actually following the normal sequence of loop formation so the loops are being formed in a normal sequence but the needle number 2 actually it does the catching but it does not clear the blue loops so it means it does the catching of new yarn but it has not cleared the old loop from its head and latch so this is how the old loop is still being carried by the needle and needle also catches the new yarn from the machine in the next course basically the needle then releases all the loops from its head so both n1 and n3 are doing all its knitting actions so it has cleared the old loop so when n2 is clearing its old loop it is clearing the blue loop as well as the red loop and it is catching the yarn which is shown in the black color so this is how a sequence if you change for a particular needle you are actually losing some of intermeshing points so for example the n2 has not done the clearing of old loop this is why two of the intermeshing points has been lost in the loop which is being created in course number 1 so uh, here is a animations through which you can understand how old loop was not being released in tuck formation and new yarn is being cast so this is the position where old loop is still under the influence of head and latch and the needle is not release this old loop and it actually catches both the yarn so it catches the new loop and it has not release the old loop in the next sequence it catches the yarn and it is releasing both the old loop and the tuck loop simultaneously so this is how you form a tuck stitch on the machine let's see again if you carefully analyze this element whenever you make tuck loop there is additional bigger loop which is hold by the needle at this particular position 
So, tuck loop is always associated with a held loop. So, tuck loop is always associated with held loop. Also, uh, you need three needles loop. So, three times needles should be acting to create tuck loop and this is obvious. If you see the held loop, this held loop is actually bigger in size because it has been hold by the needle for multiple courses. So, if you see this particular hold loop, this is present in this course as well as in this course. So, because of that, the length of that loop will increase. Since this held loop, the leg is becoming more, so it actually starts pulling the fabric in length directions. So, because of that, you will observe some kind of shrinkage along the length direction. Also, if you see this tuck loop, which is this red one uh, highlighted in bold, the legs are actually open. So, if legs are open, it means it is allowing the fabric to relax in width directions. So, because of that, the fabric width along the course direction will increase. So, this is some of the fundamental aspects how tuck loop will influence the fabric structure. So, how we actually create this tuck loop? To create tuck loop, we have to deactivate the clearing cam. So, I hope if you remember this photo, this is the cam profile of VWED machine. So, this is particularly the clearing cam, if you remember. So, this is the rising cam, then clearing cam, then stitch cam, and this one is the guard cam for VWED machine. So, in one of the position, you can see the clearing cam is actually raised on the surface. So, when the needle butt hits here, it will hit the clearing cam. But if you see here, this particular clearing cam is being projected downward. So, somehow with the help of knob, you can push this clearing cam inside the plane. So, in this way, when the butt actually moves, it will not hit the clearing cam, it will not able to rise further. So, let us see what exactly will happen. So, when the needle butt will hit here, it will rise from the rising cam, then with the help of clearing cam, it will further rise and then it will do the stitching. So, in this way you create usually loop stitch, if you follow three sequence, but in case of here, the rising cam is allowing the needle butt to rise but clearing cam is since deactivated, this is deactivated means it is going inside, so it is not there, so the butt will not strike with this clearing cam because it is pushed inside the plane, so there is no projected um, wall which can hit the butt, so that is why the butt will simply move straight. So, in this way you make tuck stitch, so this is the how the cam profile or the cam track of loop stitch and tuck stitch is defined. So, in loop stitch, the needle has to do all the knitting sequence. In tuck stitch, the needle has to do all the sequence except clearing of the old loop. Then only you can create a tuck stitch. So, again you see how uh, things are going. So, this is the clearing cam which is in deactivated position. So, in deactivated position you can see it is being pushed inside the plane. So, there is no projected metallic surface which can hit the butt of the needle. So, when the cam travels on the machine, the butt will follow this particular path. It will not go above this clearing cam because clearing cam is deactivated. This is the actual path. So, this is how needle will go because clearing cam is deactivated. So, this is why um, all the cams on a cam jacket is extremely important. So, if you play with the cam jacket, you are actually controlling the stitch amount on the fabric structure. Let us see actually this is a small video how uh, you can show this clearing cam is in a deactivated position. So, it actually raised and then goes like this. So, you can see here rising cam is allowing it to rise, but clearing cam is not activated, so it will just go straight. 
So in a machine for two traverse, there are two clearing cams from one side. So this is now this time we are um, forcing this clearing cam to go down. So when you are moving the butt from opposite direction from right to left, now this clearing cam is not activated. So it will not allow the old loop to pass from the needle and uh, the hook and the latch combination. So this is how tuck is being formed. So that was the surface which was actually not visible on the machine. So if you see the front or top view of the machine, the cam jacket will actually look like this. So if you see this cam jacket, there are two knobs, metallic knobs and um, for one when the cam jacket is moving from right to left and the other when the cam jacket is moving from left to right. So this is there to either raised or depress the clearing cam on the back side of this cam jacket. This is the active position of the metallic bar which in on which the clearing cam is at active position. When you push this bar and rotate it to other side, the clearing cam will deactivate. So this is how while in a running condition you any time uh, you can push this metallic par portion uh, to activate or deactivate the clearing cam. Let us see this video um, when I am pushing this with my finger. So this is how you push it. So when you do this, the clearing cam on the back side of this cam jacket goes inside. It will not allow the needles on this particular bed to rise and clear the old loop. Okay. There are actually four position where you can uh, play with the clearing cam. So on each bed, the jacket is moving from left to right and right to left. So whenever you are moving from left to right, you have to play with this particular clearing cam bar. And when you are moving from right to left, then you have to play with other metallic bar. So this is for one bed. For the opposite bed also, you have to do the same. So there are actually four position on the cam jacket where you can either activate or deactivate the clearing cam. So if you do this, so especially uh, for this particular bed, so for this bed, you can observe there are two needle loops are actually hold by each of the needles. So this is how tuck is being formed on the machine. Now if you see the st structure of tuck. Uh, on the front side, the structure will look like this. So if you enlarge uh, any one of the tuck loop, so you can see here the bigger size of the leg. So this bigger size of the leg is nothing but the held loop. These two legs are actually the held loop legs which is visible on the front side of the fabrics. So you can see a clear distinction of the bigger holes which you can observe on the front side. So each of these bigger holes actually which is being created by bigger held loops and at this position tuck has been formed. When you make the tuck, the lot of fabric properties will change. First uh, it will become more porous. So you can see here uh, much bigger holes are present whenever a tuck stitch is introduced. So wherever tuck stitch is introduced, since the legs become open, so that will open up the holes, so the fabric will become more porous. Uh, more lengthwise contraction, so naturally you can see this held loop which is in most tight condition, so it will pull the loops along its column, so it will try to contract the fabric in length direction. So the length of the fabric will little bit reduced. If you see the back side, back side uh, the loops are being projected towards the plane. So if you enlarge it, this is how the back side will look. So you can easily see the legs, this is the tuck loop. On the front side, held loop is visible. On the back side, tuck loop is visible or at this particular needle position. So you have only the head and two legs in a tuck stitch. So there is no foot part because the, there is no bottom loops which is holding this uh, tuck loop in place. So because of this, the legs has been open. So if you will realize the fabric will just 
become wide because the leg has become open. So, the more and more tuck loop if you introduce along a course, you will realize the fabric width will increase. Naturally, at this particular position, you can see there are two needle heads are present. So, because of that, the thickness at this particular location will increase because it will have at least three times the yarn diameter. And also, since width wise it has already extended, so you will realize the fabric is not extending um, width wise um, and it will become less extensible compared to a normal rib structure or single jersey structure. So, I have the fabric with me where you can able to see how the width is increasing by introducing more and more tuck loops and also you can able to see the thickness and wider part. So, I am going to show you that fabric. This is the single plane rib structure. I have done this analysis in the last week. So, this is the rib structure where you are creating technical front loops on both the sides. Okay. So, two beds are there, both the beds are making loop stitch, but after this point, I started introducing tuck. So, because of tuck in out of two beds, first bed is actually making only loops and the opposite bed is making tuck. So, you can see how the fabric with the same number of needles, the width has been increased. This is because on the front bed, you are making technical front loops. So, on the front bed, I am making front loops, but on the back side, when I reverse this fabric, actually on the back side, I am creating tuck loops. So, on the back side, you can see this is all made up of tuck loops. So, because of the tuck, the legs of the loop become open and this allows this fabric to spread. Also, if you see the thickness, when you measure the thickness of the fabric, you will find out the thickness of rib part and thickness of uh, this part will be more because you have the tuck stitches here. So, the thickness of the fabric will increase because at the tuck point, you have two heads which are intermeshed with the new loop. So, because of that the thickness will increase. If you see the extensibility, so the rib part when you have uh, loops from front and back bits, the stretching is much more easy. But if you see the tuck part, the stretching is actually is very difficult. So, this is how the fabric structure will change. So, now let us see how uh, it will influence the appearance. So, naturally you have seen on the front side only legs are visible, but on the back side the structure of double jersey will also change. So, not only the appearance, but also the fabric property will change because of tuck stitch in the fabric. How do we denote tuck stitch? So, this is how you denote the tuck stitch. So, especially the red part, uh, you denote tuck stitch by pointing one point in a box notation. When you have using point notation for the back side, you have to represent like this. On the bar notation, you have the representation like this. When you are looking the tuck from the front side, uh, the box uh, point will remain same. But in point notation, the notation will become reverse. In bar notation also, it will become change. So, this is how you represent the tuck loop from the front side and from the back side. So, this is the front side and this is the back side. Sometimes we can even create more complicated structures uh, where you have the needle is keep holding the old loops multiple times. and uh, it is not releasing uh, the old loop for consecutively two or three courses, then you can create much bigger held loop and you can create multiple tucks in the same location. So, here you can see four tuck loops has been created. So, if you see this diagram, so one, two, three. So, three tuck loops are there, but in the fabric part, you can see here four tuck loops has been created. So, you can see the length of this held loop, which is much, much bigger 
compared to other loops present in the structure. If you have two tuck loops, the length of held loops is lower. So, this is how tuck loops create influence on the fabric surface. If you see the back side, back side is even more complicated. So, here uh, you can see at four tuck loops, four tucks uh, legs are present. Uh, which so, if you go even more deep at microscopic level, you will be able to see that four legs in two tucks, the design looks much more simpler. So, here two tucks has been formed. In this figure, there are three tucks uh, which is there with the held loop. So, this is how not only the fabric property, but the design of the fabric will also change from the front side to back side. So, most of the projected part whenever you are seeing on the garment, it is coming because of the tuck stitches at that location. Because tuck is actually forcing that um, loop to come forward because the needle is catching two yarns uh, and it is releasing two yarns, it is knocking two yarns there. So, at, at a particular head position, you can have multiple yarn segments. So, because of that, the thickness will increase and the fabric will, will look um, projected. So, it will, it looks like sometimes peels. So, something some projected part is coming from the surface. So, this is all about tuck stitches. Now, let us uh, move to the float stitches. This is also very, very important from design point of view. Float stitches is when a particular needle is not doing any functions. In that case, the yarn will not have any intermeshing points with its old loop. So, because of that, the yarn will become straight. So, this is how you, you can see here, the, this part of the yarn is just straight. So, in this particular course, the yarn is not intermeshed with its bottom loops. This type of stitch is called float stitch or miss stitch. Now, let us see how it is being formed. So, again, now I am going to create on the needle number 2. So, to create float on needle number 2, N1 and N3 has to do its normal knitting process where it has to clear old loop, it has to catch yarn and it has to knock the old loop on the new loop. N2 has to remain ideal. So, the concept behind making float is N1 and N3 is participating in knitting, but N2 is doing nothing, it is just holding its old loop. So, this is how N1 and N3 has done the knitting process. So, it has cleared the old loop and it has catched the new yarn which is shown in the red color. But the N2 is doing nothing. So, that is why it has not catched the red yarn, but it is holding the old loop. Because of that, the new yarn will just present as a floating pattern at that particular needle position. So, this is nothing but the float stitch. In the next sequence, uh, when you make the next course, you release all the uh, loops, the two new loops from N1 and N3 and old loop from the N2. So, in course number 2, all the needles are doing the same knitting functions and in this way, it catches the new loop and old loop is being released. Since in course number 2, needle 2 was ideal because of that, the yarn which was present to the needle, it was not cached by that needle. That is why the yarn remains in the straight position inside the fabric structure. So, this is how you create the float stitch. So, to create float stitch, again you can see here, there is this animation. So, the yarn is being present, the needle is not rising, not clearing, nothing. So, yarn just remain in a straight position. After that, for the next course, it is going up and now it is catching the yarn. So, in one of the course, it has not done anything, especially when the green yarn was present in the course, it was not doing anything. So, that is why that this green yarn segment remains in the floating position. So, when you see the structure of float inside the fabric, uh, the float will always accompany the held loop. So, to create a float, again we need to create three needles loop and float loop is always accompanied by held loop. So, whenever you have to create a float, naturally that needle will not release the held loop in that particular course. So, similar to tuck, float is also accompanying the held loop. 
Now let us see on the cam jacket what need to be changed to create this particular head loop. To create float stitch, the rising cam on the cam jacket has to be changed or you have to play with the rising cam. So, if you see this particular rising cam, this is in active position. So, when the needle butt is coming from the left side, it will hit the rising cam and it will go up and follow the cam profile. But if you deactivate the rising cam at this position, you can see that metallic block is pushed inside so that it will not hit the needle butt. So, because of that, the needle will just pass straight. So, in this position, the needle uh, is hitting the rising cam. So, that is why it is following the cam track. So, here you are creating loop stitch, but in this position, the needle butt is coming here and there is no wall which is present to the needle butt. Because of that, the needle butt will just pass in a straight form. So, this is how the needle butt will just pass and this is how you create the float stitch for that particular course. So, rising cam is extremely important whenever you want to create floats in the fabric structure. Clearing cam is important when you want to create tuck in a fabric structure. So, these two cams are extremely important and stitch cam is important when you want to control the loop length. So, these all cams which we learned in week number 2 is very, very important and you must understand this functioning of these cams. Let us see how things are moving here. So, if you see the needle, needle just follow this particular part. So, needle is not rising. So, needle is just remain in ideal position. So, this is how the float stitch is created. So, I have the video where you can see what is exactly happening. So, I have pressed this uh, rising cam inside so that it will not hit the needle butt. So, you can see this is in downward position. So, now the needle butt nothing is there. So, it will not rise, it will just pass. So, if it is not rising, naturally it will neither catch the yarn, neither it will clear the old loop. So, when the needle is in ideal position, the yarn which will be present to this particular needle will not interact with the needle at all and it will just remain in a floating position inside the fabric structure. This is the cams where uh, how you control the actually floating cams. So, these two bars when you push inside uh, actually you are deactivating the needle cam. So, when the cam jacket is moving from left to right and then you if you push this inside then you are creating floating uh, loops and when you are moving from right to left then this cam has to activate for creating float stitch. This is the video. So, this is the cam which you can push it inside and outside depending on if you want to create. So, you can see here. So, I am pushed inside. So, in this way actually I am pushing that metallic block inside. So, because of that the needles on this bed is not doing anything. So, you can see here only this needle bed needles are active, but the this particular bed is not doing anything. When I am moving from this side to this side, the cam from the other side is active. So, because of that, when uh, you are moving from this side to this side, the needle is participating, but when you are moving from top to bottom side, then needle is not participating especially on this bed. So, depending on, on which side you want to create float stitches in the fabric, you play with the float cams which is the rising cams. So, now let us see the appearance. If you see the appearance, you can clearly see the bigger loop. So, here one float has been created, here two floats has been created and here four floats has been created and you can see how it is pushing the fabric in length direction. So, naturally the length of the fabric will decrease. So, this is the back side of the fabric. So, if you see four hell loops and uh, with the four hell loops, there is the floats which is floating for the four columns. Here there are two hell loops and the floats is on the back side which is floating in two columns. Here just one float, this is the hell loop and this is the float on the back side. So, depending on wherever you want to present float loop, you can play on the machine. So, the beauty of float loop is the float is not visible on the front side. So, you can if you see the front side of the fabric, 
the float is not visible, but if you reverse that fabric, then only it is visible. So, the float sometimes helps in hiding the yarns. So, on one side you can get other colors, the other side you can get uh, different colors when you play with the float loop. So, uh, if you see the fabric properties, uh, the fabric will become less extensible the because here the yarn is in a straight segment. So, naturally when you extend the fabric, a straight yarn is very difficult to extend compared to loop state. So, when you have the loop, the yarn will just open up very easily, but when you have a straight yarn, the fabric cannot be extended so easily. So, fabric will become less extensible. Snagging problem when you are using or making the garment from the back side, there is a chances that something can struck with this free segment of the yarn, these floats and it will just come out, it can pull the yarn very easily. So, so snagging problems can happen on the fabric. So, you, we have to make sure that we do not create simultaneously float loops for more than two or three columns because if it is more than that, then there is a chances that that part of the yarn can struck easily. Uh, more lengthwise contraction, so you can see here these all loops are actually pushing the fabric in or contracting the fabric in length direction or along the course direction. So, more lengthwise contraction you can observe with the help of float stitch. So, now if you note this float stitch, since in float stitch in box diagram, since the needle is not participating, so you can leave the box as a blank which represent the float stitch in technical back side as well as technical front side. In point diagram, the yarn is present in a straight form. So, in point diagram, in back side, the yarn is on the back side. Uh, in front side, the, the yarn has to be present on the front side of the fabric. So, this and with the help on bar diagram, so on this needle bar, you put a line at the bottom side which will represent float and when you are playing on the front side, you put the line on the top side. So, this is how you represent the float. Now, let us summarize what we have learned in this particular lecture. So, we have learned how you can play with intermeshing points. So, you can have four intermeshing points, you can have two intermeshing points, you can have no intermeshing points. When you have four intermeshing points, then it is loop stitch. When you have two intermeshing points, it is tuck stitch as well as when you, when the tuck stitch is present with the held loop. Uh, in case of float also, uh, you have no intermeshing points and it is accompanying with the held loop, the bigger part of the loop. So, these three stitches is, should be present in almost all weft knitted structure. So, whenever you are looking at the weft knitted structure, either you are interacting with loop stitches, tuck stitches and float stitches. So, if you see carefully any fabric, you will be able to know what the needle was doing exactly at this, that particular location of the fabric. So, this is very, very important aspect in fabric designing, engineering. So, I hope you have understood these three type of stitches that you can create by playing cams track on the machine. So, this is the cam track which I was saying. So, in case of float, the needle just goes straight. In tuck, the needle go to certain height and then it descends. And in clearing position, you are actually making the actual loop. So, the needle actually raised to the maximum height position. So, this is the maximum height position. This particular position is the tuck height position and this particular position is the miss height position. When the needle which is holding the old loop, if it is not raised at all, then it will move or make float stitch. It is raised to this particular height which denotes needle at tuck height. So, when it reached the, this particular height, then it will not clear the old loop. So, you can see the old loop is not being cleared. After that, it is actually catching the yarn at this particular location. So, having old loop in head and latch, it is catching the yarn, that is why you are creating a tuck stitch. When you allow the needle to rise to the maximum position, at this position you can see the old loop has cleared completely and while moving in downward direction with the help of a stitch cam, it is catching the yarn. So, these three different heights 
of the needle play a very very important role in determining what type of structural elements you are creating. So, if you see the cam track, so this is the rising cam, clearing cam and this is the stitch cam. So, if you rise to the maximum height when you interact with rising and clearing, you actually create a loop. When you only rise but do not interact with clearing cam, then you create tuck. And when you are not interacting with the rising cam at all, then you make float. So, depending on how much you are allowing that needle to rise from the bed, you are playing or designing different structural elements. Last, these stitches can be represented in different form. In box form, the loop is represented by cross, tuck by just point, float as a blank. In point form, the loop is represented by like this and in bar form, it is representing like this. So, in technical front, the denotation is like this. In technical back, the denotation is like this. So, I expect you to please remember this because uh, in next few classes, the structure which we will be analyzing will become highly complicated. So, you should be knowing this denotation. So, we will be using uh, this type of notations to represent some of these structures. Some common structures which we are going to analyze is like this. So, you can see how complicated the structure will become. Please go through this once more and note down the basic stitch notation. So, loop, tuck and float. So, if you see this particular structure, this structure is nothing but the combination of loop, tuck and float stitches. So, here. So, in the next class, I will let you know how you can identify at which particular position whether it is a tuck stitch or loop stitch or miss stitch and uh, you are going to represent these type of fabrics because when you try to make the diagram of this type of fabrics is highly impossible. So, it is always better you go by the notation uh, to represent these type of fabrics. So, in next class, it is all about uh, fabric notations. So, I hope you like this class, uh, stay tuned uh, where we are going to give you how you can represent this fabric structure. Thank you very much for listening, thank you.